Um, welcome everybody and hopefully um, you're seeing a, uh, the screen that's showing uh, the reproductive diseases of uh, sheep and goats. Um, yeah, as far as questions go, um, probably we'll just hold off um, and, and give those to or do those at the end would be probably easiest. Um, so and and um, thank you, Melinda. Um, the uh, uh, I'm really excited about these these webinars. I think they're going to be uh, really a, a good thing. Um, it is a bit of a learning curve, at least for me, to do some of these things uh, online versus in uh, face to face. But um, anyway, when we were when we were talking about uh, some of the, you know, putting this uh, webinar together, um, and I was asked to do uh, diseases. Of course, that's quite a broad topic. So I thought, because most of us are, you know, dealing with um, reproductive things right now, um, that I thought maybe sort of focusing a little bit more on reproductive health might be um, a, a good way to to go to kind of narrow some of this down. Um, so. You know that that said, some of these things do bleed on into um, common diseases that we see with our small ruminants. So, um, so in this lecture, I'll go over some uh, reproductive physiology just to get us all kind of thinking about the the reproductive health issues. Um, talk about abortion diseases, uh, then metabolic diseases, and then management of the lamb and kids, mm -hmm. and then the uh, diseases associated with, with uh, lambs and kids. Okay, so moving on to, to reproductive health. So again, just a little bit of, of the physiology. So our small ruminants are, are what we consider short day breeders. So they have a um, cyclic uh, during the uh, fall of the, the year. And that's when we tend to um, uh, breed them the easiest for them to then um, lamb or kid in the spring of the year. Talk a little bit about nutrition. I know we'll be covering some of this in depth at later um, webinars, but you know, nutrition is very important in the reproductive health of our, our animals and as we as they go through their their uh, gestation, the um, the requirements for nutrition will um, will change from where you know initially in the first trimester the re nutritional requirements are barely above maintenance. Um, getting into the the last part of gestation, when we see quite a uh, um, need for a higher plane of nutrition. Um, Again, poor nutrition is going to affect uh, throughout the whole gestation uh, period in these, in these animals. So we wanna try to keep them ideally roughly at a body condition score of uh, 2.5 to three. And so on this slide here is just kind of showing if we were to do a cross section through um, our animals, um, what we should be feeling for when we're um, identifying their body condition score and, um, and again, this is something that I always encourage um, anybody working with um, any livestock animals, they, they need to have a good understanding of, of body condition scores and how to assess that um, in the animals that they're, that they're working with. So um, again, a little bit of, of to the physiology. So again, the gestation in our small ruminants is roughly about five months. Um, it's common to for our small ruminants to have uh, twins triplets and in some cases even four and, and fives. Um, the uh, um, the embryo that's is is early on is kind of floating around in the um, the uterus and roughly about um, 15 to 18 days after conception is when it's going to attach itself um, to the to the uterus. So prior to that, um, it's the, the embryo is in, is in much more of a precarious situation. And, um, and so we need, oftentimes we may not even realize these, these animals are pregnant, but there are certainly things that we do to them early on that um, may cause the embryo to not um, attach and, and early embryonic death. 
So moving in um, again, you know, in early gestation, so roughly, you know, anywhere from 15 to 30 percent of losses of pregnancy can occur within the first 30 days. So we need to be aware of that and um, be careful that we're not making huge changes in how we're handling them. Um, if it's, especially if it's uh, you know, heat issues can affect negatively um, the uh, implantation in, of these um, early embryos, uh, you know, dietary changes, um, all of these can have a negative effects on, on um, the development of the placenta and the ability of this embryo to implant. Once we, we see implantation occur, then that will certainly increase the robustness of the embryo and less likely to, to see losses occurring at, at that time. Mid-gestation, good time to maybe have them ultrasounded to see, one, are they pregnant? And two, you know, are there singles or there multiples? Because that can help us manage these a little bit better as far as, as their nutritional levels. Um, if we're feeding everybody the same way, we may have the, um, the U's and, and does with singles becoming too over-conditioned and, um, and, and the up opposite can happen as well. If you're not recognizing animals with multiples, they may not be getting the plane of nutrition that they, that they um, need. Aside from um, the uh, ultrasounding, we can also do blood tests to, um, to determine pregnancy as well. And then the late gestation, um, this is where we're going to see, you know, 70% of fetal growth occurring. And so this is where, you know, by knowing that this is occurring, it should make sense to us that also their, their plane of nutrition needs to increase as well. So, um, and again, depending on the, on the situation, um, depending on what you're feeding your animals, um, you may need to start supplementing with a little bit of uh, concentrate so that we can increase their plane of nutrition to support the growth of the lambs and kids and also prevent um, pregnancy toxo tox ketosis or pregnancy disease that we'll talk about um, a little bit later. Um, Again, you know, making sure that there's always plenty of clean, fresh water. Um, if appropriate at this point to uh, vaccinate, I know Dr. England will be talking to you about uh, vaccination and, and deworming. Um, so this is oftentimes a good time to um, uh, be checking for fecal counts, uh, looking to see whether where your U's are at, U's and, and does are at as far as um, parasite load. If you're having trouble with um, uh, coccidia in your operation, this can also be um, a time for um, instituting some um, prevention with uh, coccidia as well. And then uh, once we've gone through parturition, um, postpartum care of the U and doe, uh, we want to assess them for you know, any additional fetuses, um, watching for any signs of some of the postpartum metabolic diseases, um, checking at this time, do they, you know, are they producing colostrum? What is the health of their, of their udder? Um, maybe collecting milk at this time for um, banking back, putting in your freezer uh, to have um, on hand if or need or needed um, as you're going through the, the rest of your, um, uh, the, uh, the parturition of the rest of your, your flock. Um, also, you know, closely monitoring the, uh, uh, does and use for good maternal response that they are uh, mothering up well to their offspring. Okay, so moving into um, and some of the pregnancy diseases of um, interest. So the first thing we're going to talk about is, is going to be diseases that we're going to associate with, um, with abortion. So when we're talking about, um, you know, abortion, abortion by definition is um, you know, the termination of pregnancy after the organs of the fetus have developed, but, um, but before that fetus can actually survive outside of the uterus. 
as opposed to when we talk about early embryonic death, generally this is when the, the pregnancy is terminated before the organs of the, the fetus have even begun to develop. So oftentimes early embryonic death isn't something that we may even recognize has happened because it's so early on in the process. Whereas um, abortion, we generally do tend to find the fetus, the uh, placental tissues, et cetera. Um, we can also have, there's a term called stillbirth. And stillbirth by definition is a full-term fetus that has passed out, but was basically dead before it was born. So it never actually took a breath Con compared to neonatal death where the <clears throat> fetus was born, actually took a breath or maybe even a couple of breaths and then died pretty quickly thereafter. And again, sometimes being able to identify the differences between these is difficult without uh, doing necropsy on these. Um, on the fetuses. Um, and so sometimes, again, looking at something and determining whether it's a stillbirth, whether it's an abortion, it, it can be um, a little bit muddled. Um, but we'll, uh, when I talk about, you know, trying to identify why this is even occurring, um, it, it doesn't really matter, uh, you know, stillbirth or, or natal, natal death. Um, because that will be determined, you know, at the time of um, diagnosis of why why these things are being caused. The other thing that I wanted to point out um, is is zoonotic diseases. So when we talk about zoonotic diseases, these are diseases that can be transmitted from um, our animals to humans, and um, and many of these abortion diseases that can affect our small ruminant animals can also cause diseases in humans. And so this is um, area of awareness that as we are, are you know, attending these, um, these births or our employees are attending these births, we need to be aware of the potential for disease in humans and that we are implementing good personal protection equipment so that we are not causing ourselves to be sick when we are um, um, assisting our small ruminant animals. So the most common um, infectious diseases of abortion are um, Campylobacter, chlamydia, chlamydia, and toxo. And so we'll, and then there's a, a few others that we'll talk about um, as well. Some of the non-infectious reasons for abortion, um, you know, toxic plants, uh, genetics, uh, most common genetic type things are going to be, um, uh, you know, mismatching of, of chromosomes and, um, and the development of, in some cases, these uh, genetic monsters um, that are just not gonna be compatible with, um, with life. Um, and then nutritional, again, we can see, Plenty of situations where if we're not meeting the nutritional needs of, of our animals, um, both plain of nutrition or in some cases, some of the um, minerals uh, that are needed, we can see uh, development of what we call placental insufficiency. The placenta isn't able to work or function properly and, um, and that's gonna result in, in abortion. So recognizing abortions most commonly, the way we recognize them is that we actually are presented with, um, with <laughs> dead fetus and placental tissues. Um, sometimes we can um, identify it through uh, ultrasound. Um, impending abortions, oftentimes we can see discharges, vaginal discharges, usually um, these are going to be foul smelling type of, of discharges. Um, Sometimes, you know, sickness of the dam. As we work through some of these diseases, you'll see that many times um, the dams aren't really showing any type of, of clinical sign. So um, that's not always a good um, uh, uh, metric for assessing um, impending abortions. So looking at some of the specific diseases. So chlamydia, uh, chlamydia is um, a common organism that causes abortion in, in both sheep and, and goats. Um, the chlamydia is an interesting bacteria in that it's an intercellular bacteria. And so it's, it's one of those that can be a little more difficult to, um, to treat because of the nature of that. Um, but the sources for infection 
um, of chlamydia are going to be those birthing uh, tissues, um, the fetus, the placenta, uterine fluids. Um, we can also have carrier females, and, and this is always can be frustrating in that um, these are females that are actually shedding the organism, so they can um, uh, shed the organism, which can then be picked up by other uh, ewes or does, and then they become infected, but these carrier females are not showing any clinical signs. Uh, occasionally, we can see rams become temporarily in infected um, by their association with infected ewes, uh, but the most common ways that this is being transmitted is through um, uh, either the ingestion or inhalation of these organisms um, when these animals are being exposed to some of these infected um, mucous membranes. Occasionally, uh, we can see um, use being infected through eating of contaminated materials. So the most common scenario there is these use consuming uh, the birthing placentas or other birthing tissues of other um, infected ewes. Uh, incubation period. So we talk about the incubation period. This is that period of time between when um, an animal is actually infected by uh, the pathogen and then when they are going to show some type of clinical sign. So um, it's a fairly long incubation period. Um, we can see a lot of different scenarios with chlamydia. Um, we, in the case of, of a ewe or doe that's infected early in gestation, we generally will see abortion. Um, but if they are infected, you know, mid to late gestation, oftentimes they will, um, the, they will deliver either a stillborn or weak lamb. Um, but in some cases that, um, that you will deliver a normal lamb, but then the next um, next pregnancy, she will end up aborting generally early on in her pregnancy. Um, there have also, you know, uh, scenarios where people have actually bought this problem into their, their flock. Um, they end up getting replacement ewes that have actually been infected with um, chlamydia. And, um, and so then they get put in with their, um, their other ewes. And, um, and so then initially, those replacements would would abort that first year. The um, other the other um, uh, use that that were already there on the on the place might not, especially if it was later on. Um, but then the following year, they would they would abort. Um, also, if you have lamb use that are abort that um, become in contact or that you keep with your older use. Um, you're going to see a, a higher prevalence of those lamb use aborting um, as well, just because, again, anytime we're, we're talking about younger animals, they are not going to be as immunocompetent um, as, our, as our more adult animals. So oftentimes it's that year of the abortion storm that gets everybody's attention. And, um, and, and um, and again, that, but it's, it's sometimes because of the way that chlamydia works in the system um, uh, can be confusing to uh, uh, owners why it, it's not occurring every year as an abortion storm. So prevention, uh, so with, with chlamydia, um, the, uh, we, we can do some, certainly some management thing that will help with um, preventing this. You know, one of the, the, the biggest things that I would recommend is what's on the bottom there is the biosecurity. Don't buy this problem. Um, make sure that if you are um, bringing in out your replacement animals from outside of your uh, flock or herd that you are selecting um, animals from um, uh, people that you know are testing their animals that don't have this particular problem. Um, management in, um, can help to prevent if, if you know that you, you know, do have this disease in your, um, in your production system, um, vaccination is going to be very helpful. Um, generally, we're going to vaccinate the, these animals initially, you know, with an initial vaccine and then a booster. We generally would do this right before breeding. Um, and then 
provide them a yearly booster after. Again, yearly, generally that, that booster is going to be right before breeding. So we have the best immunity um, provided for those animals um, during, um, during their gestation. Um, additional management techniques that can be helpful is, you know, separation of, of ewe lambs from the adults. Uh, this is a good management techniques, technique for a lot of um, scenarios. Also management of the environment, picking up those placentas so you're not, you know, and, and discarding them so, so other animals don't have the opportunity to, um, to eat those or um, spread, you know, contaminants. Um, um, by getting into it. And then just kind of a note there for those of you that um, with our companion animals, we do have a chlamydia vaccine that we use in cats. Um, there is not cross protection between the two types of chlamydia. So um, don't uh, um, try to use your cat vaccine to, to vaccinate your, um, your small ruminants against chlamydia. So just kind of an overview here of, of chlamydia. Um, again, it's, it's um, um, one of these, these common um, uh, diseases that we can see that's going to result in, in abortion. That picture on the slide is um, the, these uh, chlamydia abortions tend to have that uh, um, yellowing associated with it. These fetuses tend to really smell bad. Um, the best way you're going to diagnose that you do have chlamydia is by submitting um, samples to the pathology lab and letting them tell you that that is what you have um, going on. Again, the other thing that I wanna point out on this slide is the fact that um, this is a, an organism that can affect, affect people. And especially if um, you know, pregnant women coming in contact with this can potentially um, become infected and potentially have an abortion if they themselves are, are pregnant. So. Um, in some cases with, with chlamydia, we have been able to utilize vaccine in the face of an abortion storm um, to slow it down while you know in the midst of it um, and, and some success that way. Um, if we suspect that we may have, um, you know, an, a you that is, is um, uh, infected with chlamydia, um, we can also treat with uh, antibiotics, generally tetracycline is gonna work well against the, the chlamydia. Um, but again, the you know preventing with the use of, of antibiotics and, and management is gonna be the, the better option. So the next disease I'd like to talk about is, is Campylobacter. Campylobacter is, is another one of these organisms that is um, uh, out there in our environment. Um, it can be, um, uh, cause of abortion in, um, in sheep. We can see different types of abortion patterns based on whether we're dealing with Campylobacter jejuni or um, Campylobacter fetus. Um, incubation period is, um, uh, can be a little bit shorter than what we, what we see associated with, um, with the chlamydia. Um, generally with Campylobacter, most of the abortions that we're going to see will be um, associated with a third trimester, so a late-term abortion. Just the way that the Campylobacter is working in the um, animal's system, um, we get a little bit slower uh, plac placental, uh, um, uh, essentially what's happening is it's affecting the, the, the placenta and, um, and we, the placenta isn't able to function properly. But it's a little bit slower moving than um, than what we can we can see with the, the chlamydia. Again, um, these we can see carrier uh, use with this this uh, disease as well. Um, once an animal or you has had an abortion associated with uh, Campylobacter, they will develop um, immunity against it, and it generally will protect them for roughly about three years. Um, but we can also see some of them that become carriers in which they can continue to shed the organism and continue to perpetuate it in your um, your flock or herd. This um, one picture on the bottom is showing the liver of a um, uh, of a fetus that um, uh, was aborted because of Campylobacter, and it shows those little targeted lesions on the liver, and that's one of what we call a pathognomonic. Um, uh, sign of Campylobacter. So if you um, 
are doing necropsies or your veterinarian is doing necropsies and, and sees that, that's going to be a pretty good indication that that's what caused um, this abortion. Um, Campylobacter is also another zoonotic uh, disease. Uh, so, uh, you know, humans can be infected with it. Um, it can cause uh, severe gastrointestinal issues in humans, um, depending on the on which organism um, they are infected with. It can also cause abortion issues in, in pregnant women. Um, so again, one of those that we need to be careful of. Um, the hallmark for prevention of Campylobacter is um, going to be vaccinating as well if this if this gets diagnosed in your uh, flock or herd. Uh, moving on to brucellosis. So we see a couple of different brucellosis um, diseases uh, within our sheep and goats. Um, this brucellosis melatensis, uh, this is, uh, again, the principal host is going to be our small ruminants. This uh, strain of bruce brucella is most, most pathogenic in humans in that it causes um, the most serious type of, of uh, clinical signs in, in humans. Fortunately, here in the United States, we do not see bruce, this brucella melatensis very often. Um, it's generally more of a concern in, in some of the um, other countries um, that um, raise sheep and goats for, um, you know, for meat and, and milk. But it does occasionally show up in cause problems in, in humans um, that are consuming, you know, unpasteurized milk or cheese products uh, from our small ruminants. And that's um, one of the considerations for some of the regulatory um, requirements uh, when, when you're producing milk and cheese products from our small ruminants. Some of the clinical signs uh, in our sheep and goats are, will be the late-term abortions. Um, the, additionally, in our goats, we can see um, uh, arthritic types of um, clinical signs. And, um, uh, and so, you know, arthritis as well as late-term abortions um, might be an indication that um, you have some type of a, this uh, brucella in, with a problem in your um, your flock or herd. The Brucella ovis, so this is um, the B ovis, so this is what we are testing our rams for when we are moving them uh, from state to state. Uh, this form of Brucella causes um, reproductive issues in, um, in the male and uh, female. Um, it, in the male, it's going to cause um, inflammation of the testicle and, and more specifically the uh, epididymitis. So these males will um, have uh, abnormal breeding soundness exams. Um, and they can also uh, infect the uh, females. And when this occurs, then we can see abortions associated with, um, with uh, the biovis. But um, biovis is not generally a problem of concern you know, for humans getting. Um, but not something that you want in your um, in your your uh, uh, breeding sheep. And again, uh, just the there are uh, the the B, uh, abortus is uh, usually more associated with um, with cattle. Um, but again, just a reminder that these are zoonotic diseases that can be transmitted uh, to people by consuming milk or um, coming in contact with uh, placental uh, fluids, fetus <laughs> vaginal discharges. So um, we as, you know, if, if pregnant women definitely need to av avoid because of the, the abortion situations, but even, um, you know, we humans can become infected with um, um, you know, chronic illness associated with these pathogens. So um, this is another reason for the importance of making sure that you're using appropriate uh, protection when you're um, handling these, these uh, uh, products. Um, Q fever or Coxiella brunettii, uh, another common uh, organism that causes abortion in our, in our sheep and goats. Um, again, generally the sources of these organisms are gonna be the, uh, the fetus and pl placental fluids. Um, also vaginal discharges, but we can see transmission uh, through the milk, um, through manure and urine. Uh, there's also uh, venereal spread by males. We can also have the scenario with the carrier females. Again, um, 
these females are shedding the organisms, but in some cases they're not having abortion issues. So by all outward appearances, you, you might think these uh, females were fine, but yet they are actually um, uh, shedding this organism. The other interesting thing about Coxiella uh, is that it is a very robust organism in that it can survive for many years in the environment. And so there have been a few situations where, you know, an outbreak of Coxiella occurred um, in places where there hadn't been any sheep or goats for many, many years, but um, people came up infected with it. and. Um, and then looking historically, this had been, you know, an area where um, sheep and goats had been um, having youngsters and, um, and so uh, the, the organism um, uh, was, was found, you know, years later. Okay, so what to do when you suspect an abortion. Um, Again, hopefully you already, you know, are wearing your, your gloves and again, if you are you know, you're pregnant or there you have some other disease that might um, cause you to be a little more immunocompromised. You may even be wanting to wear, you know, uh, masks or um, eyeglasses to, you know, reduce um, splash transmission. But what you, when you suspect an abortion, you want to gather up the fetus and the placenta. You want to bag that up and depending on your, your pathology lab, um, if it's close by, um, you can put that in the in the refrigerator. Um, in some cases, they may um, instruct you to go ahead and freeze it. Um, and you then the other thing you want to do is get a blood sample from the dam. And um, this blood sample from the dam will be helpful because once they they um, work through the um, the uh, necropsy on the the fetus, they can also look at titers from the dam. And all of this information will be very useful to rule in or rule out a potential um, serious, you know, abortion um, infection that that uh, that you need to be aware of. Um, I can't stress this enough that um, you know don't ignore these these abortions because, um, as I've mentioned, many of these diseases we can control. Uh, through vaccinations, but you've got to recognize that um, that you have the problem um, in order to um, you know to know that you need to to vaccinate. And then again, your your uh, personal protection equipment. Um, uh, you know, at the very least, you should be having um, you know long sleeves uh, to on whenever you're assisting with, um, with uh, a parturition or whenever you're handling any type of um, uh, placental tissues, fetuses, uh, et cetera. Um, again, and, and those, if there are people that have um, serious illnesses that make them immunocompromised, um, um, even more personal protection is, it would be required in those situations. Okay, so um, let's move on to some metabolic diseases associated with our uh, pregnant animals. So the most common disease that um, that I deal with, um, certainly at the Sheep Center there at the University of Idaho, is, is going to be this um, um, ketosis, also known as pregnancy toxemia, pregnancy disease, lambing sickness, twin lamb kid disease. Um, those of you that have a lot of experience with our large ruminants, we tend to see uh, ketosis issues associated with them, usually postpartum in their early lactation. In our small ruminants, we tend to see this disease uh, most often uh, late pregnancy. Um, so roughly about, you know, the last month of, of pregnancy, um, these uh, ewes or does are going to start showing some potentially showing some signs of, of clinical disease. Um, if we have, if these ewes are, you know, in, are not on adequate pla planes of nutrition, um, if, um, again, they can be, you know, very thin, we can also see them um, be excessively fat. Uh, both of those scenarios can predispose these, um, uh, these uh, dams to um, developing ketosis. Um, so what you know? What is ketosis? What what are what are we talking about? Well, the the basic um, 
physiology that's going on here is that these animals are low in their glucose and they are either not able to consume enough nutrition orally to meet their glucose needs um, or you know in, in some cases as this uh, diagram is depicting you know when you got um, a belly full of, of fetuses it, it reduces the the amount of room there for the digestive tract and so the ability to um, you know consume and absorb those those nutrients is reduced um, if there is any other underlying disease issue, if we've got, um, you know, a, a, a foot abscess problem or, you know, some other stress uh, that these animals are being exposed to um, reduces their, their uh, uh, wanting to eat, um, that's going to predispose them to um, uh, ketosis situations. So some of the, you know, the clinical signs, I mean, the most common that I see is, is you have these late term um, uh, use and doze and they are a little bit dull, you know, they're eating, but they're not eating real robustly. Um, they get recumbent and it's really difficult for them to get up. They may um, do, you know, some grinding of their teeth, which is, which is a good indication that something's not right in their world. Um, and then as they get further along into this, this uh, disease process, um, as they get seriously hypoglycemic, we can actually see some neurological signs. We may see twitching, we might see um, you know, actual seizure activity, um, head pressing, all those kinds of things um, you know, can, can go on. So this is a, a doe that was, um, was uh, in pretty severe state of, of ketosis. And um, she was not actually, um, you know, um, uh, she, she was a comatose um, and um, uh, paddling in her, in her front limbs as, as well. So uh, what to do, ideally uh, catching this early on is, um, is the best way of dealing with this disease. Um, we want to, to get them before we can't, before they're not really wanting to eat very well, so that um, if we do recognize this in our, um, in our animals, we can start you know, supplementing them with a higher plane of, of nutrition, especially energy type foods. So those are generally gonna be your, your grains um, that are gonna provide a, a more ready, readily available source of, of glucose for these animals. We can give um, propylene glycol. So propylene glycol, we give that as a, as a drench. And what that does is it um, is metabolized to um, glucose in their, in their system. Uh, the only time that propylene glycol may not work very well is if, um, is if they uh, end up uh, having some type of liver pathology. Um, Monitoring for progression. This can be a really helpful uh, scenario, and I have this picture of uh, this uh, Nova Max. So this is a bedside um, uh, 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 monitor that you can, um, you know, you can work with your your veterinarian, and they can show you how to um, just get a little. You can get a little blood, uh, poke the ear, get a little blood, and um, and uh, put that into the. Um, the uh, uh, little strips that they have, put it in the machine, and it will it will read. Um, most of them will do glucose. Um, some of them you will do ketones as well. You generally have to have different strips uh, to do these these two um, uh, parameters. But this can be very helpful in uh, you being able to evaluate, you know, the progression of this of the animal, um, and. Um, and again, if depending on, on how serious these animals get, um, uh, they may eventually need to be uh, given IV fluids, um, dextrose, um, et cetera. Uh, in some cases, the, the um, you know, C-section or inducing parturition may be um, a scenario if to, you know, get those, those uh, youngsters out of there and, um, and try to get the, um, get the, the U or the doe back on track. Pre prevention is definitely the key, and um, and so if you're if you're having some issue with this in your your flock or your herd, I definitely recommend some um, survey analysis of your animals to see whether they are are um, lacking in uh, certain types of um, 
um, uh, nutrients that you may be able to um, to improve upon. Uh, definitely need to have them on a you know a, a late gestation type of ration. Um, so uh, you know we can try again try to prevent this from from occurring. Hypocalcemia, um, also known as, as milk fever. Again, in our small ruminants, we can see this occur uh, both before and after parturition. Uh, before parturition, the uh, demands of the, of the fetuses, their, their calcium demands um, can reduce the calcium levels in uh, the dam. And then postpartum, similar to what we think about in, in cattle, it's gonna be those lactational demands. Um, some of the clinical signs with uh, lack of um, calcium is going to be usually muscular signs, so muscular twitching, um, recumbency. Uh, if it gets serious enough, these animals will get depressed, um, not <laughs> eating very well. Can be difficult sometimes to recognize whether you're dealing with, you know, a, a pregnancy toxemia or hypocalcemia um, without actually doing some blood work on these animals. Um, and, and so in some cases when we're, you know, treating animals, we're, we're kind of doing a gunshot um, scenario and giving them um, a, um, uh, fluids that, that contain a little bit of everything um, as we're treating them. Again, in most cases, if, you've, if you have them on um, good late gestation ration, uh, the, um, uh, the calcium issue isn't gonna be a problem. Um, but if you have a you know history of it, or you know that maybe your nutrition, uh, your feedstuffs are low in calcium, then some type of a supplement will de would definitely be uh, indicated. Moving now to some of the disorders that we can see postpartum: uh, uterine prolapse, um, retained placentas, um, endometritis, metritis, pyometras, and then we can also see pregnancy toxemia and hypocalcemia postpartum um, as well. And essentially, you know, the treatment postpartum is going to be the same as what we would do prepartum for those, those metabolic diseases. So retained placentas, fortunately in our small ruminants, we don't have near the problems with retained placentas that we do in our, um, in our large ruminants. Um, generally, I will consider the, the placenta retained if it hasn't passed 24 hours after parturition. Um, and in most cases, I find too, is that after 24 hours, usually just you know, giving a gentle tug will um, uh, help get rid of or, or bring that placenta um, right out of the, um, the, uh, the animal. The reasons that these are occurring tend to be associated with um, um, nutritional issues. Um, animals that are low in magnesium, calcium, and selenium, it does affect the ability of the uterus to, to involute after, after parturition, and it's that process of, of involution that is um, helping you know, to get that placenta passed. Um, we can see other inflammatory uh, issues associated with it. Um, so again, I will monitor these animals. If it hasn't, like I said, if it hasn't passed within 24 hours, I'm you know, checking their temperature um, because we do know the longer that stays in there, that's gonna set them up for developing a um, uh, endometritis problem. And, um, and those animals can get very sick from that. So monitoring temperatures, monitoring um, their attitudes, uh, to see whether you know we need to do you know any further um, treatment once the the placenta has been removed, we can utilize things like um, oxytocin um, to help the um, the, the uterus um, involute um, in our in in our sheep. Um, we do need to be a little bit careful with the oxytocin write off so we don't actually produce um, a. Uh, um, uh, produce this, a uterine prolapse. Um, so uterine prolapse is generally, if they're going to occur, so this is where the, you know, in the most common scenario is, you know, that you're getting the fetuses coming out and, um, um, and the U or the doe gives one last heave and out comes the, um, the uterus as well. And so this is, an emergency situation um, needs to, to be replaced. Generally gonna be something that um, you're, you're 
want to get the assistance of your veterinarian to help you do this. Um, and uh, again, if you know the, the sooner these are attended to, um, the better the opportunity is to get them back in place and have them stay there. Um, these animals are generally not going to be animals you want to um, keep in your in your your flock or your herd, but in the short go, if you can get that replaced. Um, and, and they continue to do well, they could certainly be um, kept around to, um, to raise the, um, the young. Pyometra or me, and or metritis. So pyometra is basically just a, a pus filled um, uterus. Um, again, not something that, um, that I have seen too commonly in our, in our small ruminants. Um, we can have um, uh, most common uh, uh, idea that this is going on is you're going to see this pussy discharge being passed from the the uterus um, uh, from the vulva area um, and and so we can utilize um, uh, medicines to try again to help um, get that um, that uterus to to involute and express all of that material out of there um, we may need to do some uh, some flushing may be helpful um, and uh, some additional hormone therapy may be helpful in, in getting that cleaned out um, and get these, these animals treated. Moving on to mastitis. So uh, mastitis, at least at the Sheep Center um, at the U of I, that is one of our um, main uh, reasons that we cull uh, these ewes. And, um, and I think <laughs> part of it is, is um, you know, uh, in a, or the inability to um, recognize some of the early mastitis that, that gets started in these animals, treat that, and then um, keep it from developing into a, a chronic mastitis. Um, so one of the things that I always, you know, recommend is to um, make sure that those, those udders are being checked um, and that they're being checked, you know, pretty um, regularly. You know, initially when we've got the um, uh, the dams and the and the youngsters uh, together in, you know, hopefully a close area where we can keep an eye on them, we um, look for signs that um, that a mastitis might be be going on. You know, sometimes it's obvious. We might see, uh, you know, a swollen um, uh, or lacerated nipple. Um, uh, other other situations, you know, a lame ewe, a, a ewe that's walking, you know, it's lame, especially on her hind legs, um, that can be an indication that she actually has a mastitis going on because every time she bumps that um, that mammary gland, it hurts, so she she walks a little differently. So if you see, you know, a, a lame animal, lame animal, check. Don't forget to check that mammary gland. Um, the other thing too is if you're seeing lacerations on the nipples, um, check the teeth on the lambs and the kids, because sometimes they're born with these little snaggle teeth. And, um, and if you don't address those, they're gonna continue to cause abrasions in um, the, the nipple area, which could then potentially lead to, to a mastitis. Um, so, you know, look at those, those uh, the kids and lambs and, um, you know, side cutters or a little file oftentimes can take those, file down those uh, snaggle teeth. Um, generally, though, what's happening with our, you know, ma with mastitis is it's a, um, an ascending uh, bacteria that uh, gains entrance from the end of the teat and then moves on up into the um, mammary gland, causing um, inflammation and, and infection. And so if we can identify these early on, um, we have some, we can use some um, um, intermammary uh, treatments, again, uh, we do not have any labeled for our small ruminants, so we get into this realm of, you know, extra label use. So I, you know, would recommend that you are working with your veterinarian um, so that um, you're, um, you know, following all the, the guidelines uh, for extra label use. But these can be very effective in getting uh, rid of this, um, uh, these acute cases of, of uh, mastitis um, and then not allowing them to, um, to go on to become chronic. Uh, additionally, we um, we typically think of, of mastitis as being, you know, bacterial infection. There are a couple of, um, or one main uh, viral 
infection in our sheep that causes uh, what we call you know this blue bag or hard bag and it's caused by um, a uh, um, I believe it's a retrovirus um, ovine progressive um, pneumonia virus um, OPP and um, this is an important um, virus to know whether you do or don't have this in your flock. Um, if you do, you want to. There, there are strategies out there to get your flock free of this. Um, once, so generally, the you know adults are, are generally infected. Usually, it's going to be a respiratory um, issue where um, it gets spread from from um, an infected you to a non-infected you. Um, and then when that you then becomes pregnant and her offspring will then be infected through the consumption of the of colostrum and um, and also the milk products and so then it gets perpetuated into the um, um, the flock that way so um, uh, recognizing that it's it's there and utilizing you know either um, uh, separating the the dam from the youngsters at birth or pasteurizing your colostrum or you know pasteurizing milk um, you know can be be a way to um, avoid transmission um, that way um, also I have this picture of a goat um, similar the similar virus in, in goats is going to cause um, the uh, cap caprine in arthritic encephalomyelitis and or this chronic degenerative um, arthritic disease of, of goats and um, so when I was first out in practice, I saw a lot of this in goats and um, um, understanding the, the transmission in that um, has definitely um, uh, reduced the, the prevalence of seeing that disease um, uh, nowadays. Some additional management on mastitis. Um, so ways, you know, pre preventing mastitis. Um, sanitation is, you know, needs to be starred. Um, oftentimes the way that these, these uh, these infections start as these animals are, are laying in um, rather dirty environments and and so that just opens the door for um, bacteria to to move up um, into the, the uh, mammary gland so um, you know good sanitation um, make sure that the bedding is clean especially when these animals are, are in the jugs um, you know putting clean straw shavings so that they're not laying down in in um, the filth will, will certainly help um, at the time of weaning, this is another critical time when mastitis can um, occur when we're getting ready to dry them off. Um, so reducing their protein levels will be beneficial. Um, also withholding water 24 hours prior to um, uh, weaning uh, is beneficial to reduce um, some of the, the mastitis at that time. If you wanna use a, a dry off, um, infusion such as we do with dairy cattle again um, it's going to be extra label work with your veterinarian on that but that can also be helpful in uh, preventing um, uh, mastitis issues all right so moving on to uh, lamb and kid diseases so in you know preparing for the newborn um, we can prevent a lot of um, situations with our with the newborns um, by just uh, preparing a, a clean, dry place for them to, uh, to be born in. Um, and, you know, remembering that uh, early on, our um, lambs and kids are not able to regulate their temperature. So um, we need to provide them areas where they're not going to um, get uh, too hot or especially too cold. So. Um, also dealing with, um, you know, those, those navels, um, the, uh, I like to see um, navels roughly about two to three inches long. If they're longer than that, I will go ahead and, and snip them off. Um, and if there's any concern of, of bleeding issues, you can use a little bit of umbilical tape there to, to tie them off. Um, and then make sure that you're, you're dipping with, um, again, my favorite is chlorhexidine, um, you know, the, the uh, Betadine is, is certainly good as well, uh, but it just needs to be done, and in some cases, uh, maybe done a, done a couple of times. Also, um, making sure that, that these lambs and kids can nurse. So I have this one picture of this, um, this goat, and um, 
uh, she's really not too bad, but sometimes you'll see these, um, these very engorged mammary glands and consequently the nipples are very engorged as well. And so these youngsters can't even get their mouths around that tuner. So um, these are gonna be animals that you may need to remove some of the, the colostrum from them and even going forward, maybe even you know milk them um, if there's if they're really heavy milkers so until that lamb or kid gets big enough that they are able to um, to get around that nipple and and nurse effectively. Um, so just as something you know to to be aware of of uh, there. Um, if this is uh, this slide is is um, just showing how much. Uh, kids and lambs should be eating um, those those first few days and um, um, making sure that they are you know consuming um, this this volume again if in, if there's any doubt whether a lamb or a kid is up eating then um, uh, you know, train your eye to and your and your hands to be able to feel. You know, does that does that belly area does it feel like it's there's you know that there's fullness in there? Does it feel like there's something in there? If um, if there isn't, then um, you need to be tubing these these uh, guys to make sure that they're getting um, getting that nutrients, especially early on uh, for that that colostrum. Many many of these diseases that. Um, that uh, be talking about with lambs and kids can be uh, prevented by um, by uh, making sure they have plenty of colostrum. Um, I'm also a big proponent of of uh, having again storage of colostrum, um, banking your colostrum. So you know um, we can generally safely take about four ounces of colostrum out of most of our um, use and and dose from each side. And you know, put that in little baggies and put it in the in the freezer. Mark the date, um, and and it should be used up within within a year. Um, when you need to use that colostrum, the best way is put it in a hot water bath and to let it thaw, and then um, and then give it give it to whoever needs it. Um, microwaving is going to destroy some of the um, antibodies, so want to avoid that if possible. Okay, so some of the um, the disease um, issues that we can see early on is um, is again this you know these stillborn um, these you know the weak or, or dead lambs um, and again you know the did they breathe or did they not breathe and these these two pictures here are showing if you did a necropsy on a fetus you would be able to determine this so the upper picture. Uh, that lung is still is purple it's consolidated that particular youngster did not take a breath. Whereas the bottom one, we can see some pinkish color. Um, if you were to feel that lung, it would feel, um, you'd feel little air pockets um, in there. And that animal did take at least one breath. Um, most of the reasons why, um, you know, we, we do see stillborn um, or these weaker dead lambs are gonna be associated with um, uh, they got too cold if it wasn't an attended birth. Um, so, you know, uh, hypothermia, um, low uh, glucose levels. Again, if we're dealing with a, a, um, a mom who is, is low on her uh, glucose level, maybe in a low grade um, pregnancy toxemia situation, um, that's going to affect the, the youngsters as well. And, and they just don't have enough energy to, to get going. And then, of course, dystocia, anything that delays them getting um, uh, through the birth canal and out um, potentially is going to um, uh, develop a hypoxia, so where they just aren't getting enough oxygen, and then by the time they get born, they're, they're too far gone to, um, uh, to be able to survive. And then I've listed um, uh, some infectious agents there that we've, um, we've talked about most of those. So the hypothermic or hypoglycemic lambs. So again, this can occur, um, you know, they're born, you think that they're up and they, they're eating well, and then um, you come in, you know, one morning and you've got, you know, a, a, a lamb that's just, you know, all huddled up, um, not very responsive. You take its temperature and it's below 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And um, that's gonna be a clue that you need to do something for this, this lamb. And, um, and again, what we need to do is we need to provide them with some form of, of energy source and then get them warmed up. Um, 
the uh, and and again, I, I want to stress that the the energy source needs to be provided first before we tend we try to um, warm them up or will cause them to go into to seizures. So if they are are able and they can nurse, then um, you know some warm milk, uh, some warm you know warm sugar water, warm uh, you know what I call the Kool Aid stuff, the uh, electrolyte with glucose supplement. Um, get that into them. Um, if they are not able to suck, then um, tubing them with um, some type of an energy source. Um, if they are comatose and not able to swallow, then uh, you need to be trained on how to give like an a interperitoneal shot of 50% um, dextrose. And um, that's something that's um, uh, easily taught by, by your veterinarian or knowledgeable uh, person. But again, remember, get that energy source into them first and then warm them up. Um, warm, you know, there's a little warming box that I'm showing on the slide here. Another, you know, five gallon bucket uh, filled with warm water, put the, the lamb or the kid in a um, garbage sack and set them in that, that water. Um, you know, it's an, that's one way we do things at the, at the Sheep Center and it works really very effective. Um, sudden death of our young lambs and kids. So the majority of the times this is going to be associated with um, usually some a toxin that's being released by, um, by a bacteria. Um, and generally it's the most common ones that we're going to see are going to be the, the perfringens, um, type C or, or tetanus. Um, and, uh, and again, it's, it's, um, <laughs> usually I'm going to be an environmentally associated. Um, again, another area, reason to have very clean lambing areas and disinfect that, that navel because oftentimes it's um, traveling up through that, that open navel area that allows um, some of these bacteria to, to gain ent entrance. Uh, respiratory diseases. Um, so we can see pneumonia. Um, and again, if it's if it's uh, overwhelming enough, we're going to see um, these lambs maybe, you know, uh, a short period of, of respiratory distress before they um, before they die. Um, again, management, um, it, you know, if they don't get that colostrum, uh, stress, you know, crowding, unsanitary conditions, poor ventilation. Um, if you have a lot of animals that are in a poorly ventilated room, there's going to get that increase in in ammonia smell, and um, and that's going to be uh, hard on their on their lungs. One thing that I uh, wanted to uh, to mention, both with with pneumonia as well as um, the um, the clostridial toxins, um, you know, utilizing those types of vaccines in our ewes or or does. So you give those to the ewe and the doe, you know, roughly a month before parturition. You're going to have good levels of those immunoglobulins into those youngsters if they get appropriate amount of colostrum, which can certainly help them, you know, fight some of these, um, the clostridial as well as um, uh, pneumonia as well as this, the scours. But um, again, the the scours um, caused by bacterial, viral, parasitic. Um, the we don't have some of the um, the vaccines. Um, for sheep uh, that we do in cattle, but I have had um, uh, uh, small ruminant people use um, E. coli and rotacoronavirus vaccines from uh, cattle successfully in, in the, um, um, uh, the small ruminant world as, as well. Um, the navel or joint ill, again, we can see this, you know, shortly after birth, which is generally going to be associated with more of a, of a navel ill type thing. Um, we can then see this occur again um, after, you know, uh, processing, uh, castration, tail docking. Um, again, anything that potentially opens the door for uh, bacteria to gain entrance, uh, we can then, you know, potentially see um, some of these uh, uh, diseases um, occur. So again, environmentally making sure that, you know, when you're performing these, the, the processing that you're, you're um, being as clean as you can, and then um, a good clean environment. And then healthy lambs, make sure that when, when you're getting ready to process your, your lambs um, or dehorn your, dehorn your, your uh, kids, that that they are healthy, that there's not something else going on with them. Um, and then you 
uh, process them and, and make everything much worse. Uh, coccidious, coccidiosis. So this is generally something that we're going to see um, in the a little bit older lambs. Um, we uh, um, uh, tend and and we talk about it being a you know bloody diarrhea type of, of issue. Um, and most of the my my experience has been is that I've rarely seen it be a, a bloody diarrhea in the small ruminants. Um, generally, I just see it just this profuse diarrhea and um and then when you take a take a look at the the uh, feces and you see the um the coccidia um and again this is a problem that once you you know you get it into your your flock it's or your herd it can be very difficult to get out of because of the fact that it tends to hang around in the environment and so again if you know that this is a problem in your in your flock or your herd um, instituting some type of, of um, you know pre prevention such as a coccidia stat can be very helpful uh, in this situation but in some cases especially if you have stressed bummer lambs um, where you may get this um, uh, outbreak of, um, of coccidia then you may need to just um, treat them for that um, uh, uh, disease. Selenium uh, white muscle disease. Again, this is a problem here in the in um, much of the Pacific Northwest, and uh, most of our forages are are deficient in it. So um, I just routinely uh, you know recommend that this is something we um, deal with in our uh, both flocks and herds. Um, my general recommendation is um, you know a shot of the the BOCI to the lambs at processing as opposed to giving it to the ewes. There's, there's been some anecdotal research out there that um, uh, giving the, the uh, selenium to the ewes sometimes has caused um, abortion. And um, and so um, I've just experienced, you know, I just feel a lot better just giving, going ahead and giving it to the, to the lambs. Um, I also do feel this is something that is good to, you know, just do a surveillance on your animals periodically to see where you're at with your within your flock and herd. A couple of ways you can do that is um, you can do blood tests and have the, you know, the blood tests and they can run levels of selenium for you. Um, what that's going to tell you is basically how you've been doing the last three months with your animals, and um, and so it's a, you know so that's it's it's not bad. It's not you know giving you um, uh, wasteful information. Um, if you want to know more immediately how your animals are, are doing, then you need to have um, samples of liver. And um, so uh, you know we can do liver biopsies. But another good source of of a liver sample would be um, if you do have dead fetuses, maybe um, taking some of that liver and just having it sent in. And um, and just see one was that maybe part of the reason that this fetus is is dead and two you know what was the um, what is the level of selenium because that's going to tell you you know that that can be associated with the level of selenium in that in that uh, the dam and and again it can be a good good way of surveilling how how you're doing in your in your flock or herd. Uh, get enterotoxemia so um, uh, similar to what. Um, we can see with our, you know, newborns. Um, generally, with enterotoxemia of our older lambs, um, generally is going to occur when they, when you're getting ready to to wean them and then move them on to, um, um, you know, forages and, and grains. Um, and again, th this is usually a found dead type of situation. Um, you um, and it can be difficult to. Um, diagnosis at, at necropsy. So a lot of times we just, you know, suspicion, if we've ruled everything else out like pneumonia, um, then we may suspicion that this is what's going on. Again, um, you know, utilizing your, your clostridial vaccines can be very helpful in, um, in reducing this problem. Um, timing needs to be considered though. Um, again, if you vaccinated the ewe, and so she's passed that on to the newborn, roughly about you know four to six weeks after that that newborn was born, those antibodies are are going to be um, at a level that they may not be protective. So um, 
vaccinating those um, these late lambs about two weeks before you're gonna make a significant uh, food change can certainly reduce the chance of um, them developing this, uh, this enterotoxemia. Um, acidosis or, or grain overload, again, uh, this is usually as associated with some of the feeder lambs, a rapid change to um, high concentrate diets. I've also seen this occur though in our pregnant ewes when, um, you know, a, a producers concern that their plan of nutrition is, is not adequate, so they make a, a major adjustment in their, their concentrate, and, um, and then we can see a, uh, um, an association with um, the, the, the change in the, the feed, plus the fact that this, this ewe is carrying a lot of weight around because she's um, late gestation, and all of those um, uh, add up to a uh, definitely a founder situation. Uh, urolithiasis or water belly. Uh, so this is um, a, uh, caused by um, urinary calculi that develops within the bladder of the of um, the animal, and then as they are pa are passing, trying to pass these stones out through the urethra, they get stuck, and um, and then um, we can get then rupture of the urethra, and then urine starts to move out into the um, the uh, tissues around um, the prepuce and, um, and you get that, what we call that, that water belly. And so uh, again, most of the time I have seen this um, associated with, um, certainly with weathers, and then certainly if they are on um, alfalfa diets. And so if there's been a history of this problem, um, then, um, then that's one of the first things I'll recommend is, is uh, a change of diet that way. Um, uh, polioencephalomalacia, uh, so this is caused by lack of thiamine and um, these animals, uh, again, we, we can see that's, you know, secondary to something that's um, uh, causing them to not eat very well. And, um, and so, um, they can develop this, uh, this what they call the stargazing, and this is what's being depicted in this this picture here. Um, I have occasionally uh, seen this in some of my late pregnant ewes as well, and um, and so um, and again, I think it, it it occurs because they just aren't eating very well, and so um, if I suspect that, um, I will also administer some. Uh, thiamine to those uh, those use as well, um, you know, to uh, uh, to to get that thiamine replaced and um, and uh, stop this process because if it if it keep, continues to go on, these animals will um, will die. And then, of course, the scours and the um, um, uh, diarrhea issues. Um, Again, we can see, you know, we can see different causes of some of the diarrhea. Um, uh, salmonella and um, E. coli are, are usually the two that, um, um, well, we tend to see E. coli usually in, in younger and then the salmonella generally a little bit in the older. And again, both of these are potentially zoonotic diseases. So um, you do need to, you know, be, again, be keeping that in, in mind when you're um, dealing with, uh, with these, these animals. Um, best way you, that you can diagnose these is to send uh, fecal samples in for um, culture to see just you know, what actually is, is uh, um, growing there. Um, and then uh, um, you know, tr uh, treating both, again, with you know, antibiotics as well as, as um, uh, fluids um, and um, and good, you know, uh, nursing care um, to get them turned around. Uh, again, the uh, pneumonia. Uh, um, this is um, what we can, you know, similar similar um, uh, pathogens that are going to cause pneumonia in our um, older animals, as we can see in our younger animals. We don't you know, tend to um, necessarily talk about shipping fever in our small ruminants, though the, the pathogenesis is similar to uh, shipping fever in, um, in our large ruminants. Basically things that, that um, cause stress in these animals are 
then allow some of the pathogens that live normally in the upper airway in the nose to move down the uh, um, uh, respiratory tree into the um, into the lungs causing um, uh, pneumonias. Um, we can sometimes see some of the other opportunistic, some of the pastorellas, of the manheimias, um, which we do have uh, good vaccines for. So if you identify those as the problem causers, then institute uh, some type of vaccine strategies should be helpful there. Um, one thing I will also mention about um, mycoplasma. So we um, we do have a lot of our domestic um, uh, flocks that are infected with mycoplasma. Mycoplasma itself tends to not be much of a problem causer, except when these animals do get stressed and then uh, we get some of these other pathogens starting to cause problems in, in their respiratory tract, then the fact that they are also infected with mycoplasma is going to worsen that whole scenario and, um, uh, and potentially send, set them up for dying um, from a pneumonia episode because of the synergistic effect of, of uh, those two pathogens. Uh, rectal prolapses. Uh, this te there's tends to be some genetic component to this. Um, we also, you know, those, uh, I feel that tail docking, getting the, the tails docked too short, we can certainly see some uh, problems with um, lack of innervation to that area. Definitely these animals that are on in, you know, dusty environments, so they're coughing a lot, uh, can put a lot of pressure back in that area and, and potentially set them up for, um, for rectal prolapses. Again, um, we usually consider recommending culling these animals um, because um, that there is a, a weakness, and um, um, unless there's you know some reason to to keep them around, that would generally be my my recommendation. But again, there are some preventions: a little bit longer tail uh, docking, and then um, you know re reduction of dusty environments. Um, copper, uh, so uh, copper toxicity, especially, um, it can be a problem in our um, in our small ruminants. Um, usually, the biggest reason that we see this issue is where people make the mistake of using feeds that were formulated for other species, such as cattle or horses or chickens, and um, decide to feed it to their um, their small ruminants and um, and then they can cause this uh, copper toxicity. In the acute form of, of the toxicity, we're gonna see death in these animals. Um, there's a, a chronic form that can actually be somewhat underlying for a period of time, and then a stress occurs, and then those animals are, are found dead. Um, generally, again, necropsy is gonna be how you're gonna um, diagnose this. Um, Toxicity and deficiency, there's there's narrow range there. Um, generally, deficiency of, of copper is can we tend to see more um, neurologic issues in our in our um, uh, young animals um, that may be indicative of a of a copper deficiency. Um, ringworm, <clears throat> again, ringworm is something that we can we uh, can see with our especially our club lambs because at this point this is where they're being handled by um, uh, people and if um, and if the the uh, animal has the the fungus and um, the uh, people come in contact with it, then they're going to develop those um, nice patches on their arms. That um, indicates a ringworm. And most of us who have been handling a lot of livestock animals most of our lives, we probably have pretty good immune immunity to it, and and so we don't get it. But when the you know the cousin from the city comes and wants to you know, pet the, the animals, that's generally when, when the problem occurs. And I, I think that is it. So, um, thank you all for listening and um, I will we'll go ahead and attempt to answer questions. Fantastic, thank you so much for taking the time to tell us about all of those things. I know it was a really big talk, topic for us to ask you to do. Um, so as far as questions, anyone who has something general, go ahead and throw it up in the chat. We did have one question earlier on uh, during the chlamydia section that had to do with um, whether or not use could be tested before you buy them. And I think mm -hmm. um, 
that plus any of the other zoonotic diseases if there's testing. Right. So, um, so there is, um, there is well, like Waddle over at, over at Washington State University. They have what they call a, a biosecurity screen, and so um, you can uh, you can send that. Uh, you get a you can <laughs> sample, and um, and you can sample the blood and send it in, and they'll run it for um, um, OPP. Uh, they'll do um, uh, um, yonis. Um, they'll do. Uh, chlamydia, Campylobacter, um, and, and, and you can ask for additional ones at the time. So basically what they're looking for is going to be um, is uh, titers, uh, CL, uh, caseous lymphadenitis. That's another one that, they'll, that they can test for. Um, so, um, so yes, any of those, those um, diseases of concern, um, you can you know, have, have uh, um, titers run before. Um, <laughs> And uh, um, and that should you know assure you either you know that this particular animal that you feel like you're you're uh, bringing in is is fine. Um, another thing that you can do is if you know you you get an animal before you turn that animal um, out with the rest of your um, your flock or herd is while they're in their quarantine, um, go ahead and and have them tested at that point. And then if they were to come become positive on certain things, then um, tincture of time and strategies can be implemented to help you get that animal over it before you put them in with, um, um, with your other animals. Not with all the diseases, but with some of the diseases. Okay. There was also a question about which units you were using for feeding lambs on that slide. And then also could Gatorade be um, an option for the electrolytes. Um, what, what was the second part of that? Whether Gatorade could be used as an electrolyte for the lambs? Um, you know, I haven't used Gatorade. Um, I, I get that, um, that kid and lamb electrolyte. It, I call it the blue Kool-Aid because um, that's what it looks like when you mix it up. And um, um, so I, I don't think of that without actually looking at the, you know, the um, amounts of product in that Gatorade, um, I, I probably wouldn't recommend it um, and just get a, you know, a lamb or kid electrolyte uh, replacement. Okay. And then the last question that I see here is um, having to do with how much thiamine we should be giving um, user goats that we suspect of polio. So, so, so generally, um, thiamine is only going to be a problem if they are not eating well. Uh, the The nice thing about the, the microbes in the rumen is we we don't consider having to supplement our, um, our ruminant animals because those, those microbes actually produce the B vitamins. And so generally where you run into problems with a thiamine is, um, is when they um, aren't eating properly. And so, um, but generally I wanna say that it's, it's when we give um, thiamine, we're, we're generally giving it uh, roughly, I wanna say about 500 milligrams on that. Um, and then depending on how serious the clinical signs are, um, uh, I've had, had uh, uh, the ones that are most serious, I generally are treating them, them twice a day for um, two days and then once a day for about five more days. Okay. Uh, the next question is, are there any questions that vets would specifically like to be asked before taking our sheep to them for treatment? Um, well, I, I think one of the first things is make sure that they do treat sheep. I, I know that's one of the, the questions that um, is, you know, I, I get, uh, when I get phone calls, it seems to be from um, individuals who, you know, they, they have their veterinarian who works on their, you know, their dogs and their cats and their horses and their cows, but then when they, you know, ask them about a, a sheep, they kind of, um, you know, give them a blank stare. Um, so 
so I would, you know, make sure that they do feel comfortable um, either with working on sheep or feel comfortable, you know, researching what they need to research to be able to help you. Um, what, again, what I, I and I'm, and I'm kind of pulling from my own experience when I was practicing um, because I was, you know, a big believer in um, providing my clients with the tools that, that, that they needed so that, um, um, you know, they could tell me, um, it, you know, good information. And, and so that's why, you know, look, you know, using those, those, uh, um, the glu glu glucosometer <laughs> um, and being able to, to, you know, tell your vet, well, they have this, this, you is acting like she's got pregnancy toxemia and I've, you know, pricked her ear and her, and her glucose is, is uh, 40 and her, um, you know, ketones are, are 0. 0.6. And, um, and again, that may not necessarily, if you were to pull blood on that animal, um, you probably would, would find that, that the glucose was a little bit higher and the ketones were a little bit lower, but still your vet's going to look, hear that and go, okay, this animal needs something. And, um, and so, you know, having that information and, and then being able to quiz you on, well, you know, what are the clinical signs, you know, you know, take the temperature, um, how alert is it? How well is it eating? Uh, can it get up? Um, you know, all those kinds of things will help um, help them assess um, one whether they need to come out and do something immediately, or two whether um, you may be able to just you know drench drench them with some uh, propylene glycol and, and see how they do. Okay. Uh, there's a question about blood pregnancy checking. Is there some kind of shoot side test, or is that something that you have to send in? Um, there are some, um, the, the tests that they have um, are, you have to do a bunch of them at one time in order to make them more cost efficient, I guess. Um, and, you know, the, the uh, um, do, you know, there's quite a little bit of a recipe that you have to follow. So if you were going to be doing, um, I'm going to say, you know, like 100 animals, um, then some of those tests would be, would it'd probably bring that test down to like $5 an, an animal. Um, if, if you're just doing a few, then usually it's probably going to be more economical to, um, you know, to, to do something like a Bioprint that where you can contact them and they will actually, you know, send you the whole kit of being able to pull the blood and the test tubes and everything. And then once you have the blood, then you package it up and you send it back to them. And, um, and I think those tests are, are running, you know, less than $10 a test. So for, for a few animals, that would be um, probably most uh, economical. Um, again, if you have, you know, the, a, a lot of animals, probably, to be honest, the ultrasounding is, is probably going to be most, uh, most economical there. Okay. We have several questions on vaccinating and just so you guys know, tune in next week because that's the topic for next right. week. Um, <laughs> but yeah. we did have a question that's relevant to right now. And that is if a doe is about to kid within two weeks, is mm -hmm. it too late to give her CDNT vaccine? Um, no, I don't think it is too late. Perfect. Okay, there's a question about sore mouth in show goats and if there's any prevention for outbreaks. So, um, Are you done? yeah, um, I would, I would look at that and I would want to see just what was causing that. And if it was, um, if it's the, um, you know, the, the same pathogen that's causing the, the ORF in, um, in sheep, then you, you could consider vaccinating. Um, that, yeah, that's a, that's kind of an interesting, we have a little bit of ORF in our um, youngsters up there at the, the sheep center. And at, no. at least at this point, it has not really gotten, um, um, you, you know, outside? serious enough where I feel like we, you know, I want to vaccinate the animals. Um, so, uh, and it does seem to be self-limiting. 
in that it, it uh, takes care of its, itself. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it is difficult because, you know, you can't, it, and, and, but the other thing about that too, is it's a zoonotic disease. So you need to be, if you're handling these animals, make sure you have your gloves on. Um, and it, it's going to be one of those situations where active um, infections are, yeah, they're not going to allow you, you know, into the show ring with those. Okay. Um, there's a question about some uterus, a very small uterus lining coming out just before lambing when they're laying down. Mm -hmm. oh, I lost it. And it always goes back in. Is this a, re a cause for concern or culling the animal? Yeah. So it's probably, um, um, again, some, you know, vaginal uh, tissue there. Um, usually those, again, if, it, if it's going back in once they, <coughs> excuse me, stand up, um, and it's not, you know, you're, we're not seeing like a lot of excessive straining. Um, I think I would just treat it with, you know, just kind of conservatively at this point. Um, if, as long as she, the animal gets through parturition fine without, um, you know, any prolapsing, that type of thing, um, uh, at, at least at what you're telling me now, I wouldn't necessarily consider culling at this point. Okay. Uh, this question has to do with having up to five animals that have had polio in one pasture. Is there any environmental causes that you know of? No, I'm not yet. Um, it's quite exciting. So you can watch the go. Um, there, there are some. Um, there are some environmental uh, situations where. Um, we can can see um, you know breakdown in ba basically, and I'm thinking that um, we well, I mean we do know that certain types of um, funguses like that get into you know some of the the corn and the concentrates can actually um, produce um, uh, some of these uh, thymonases which will um, result in um, breakdown of thiamin. But um, as far as you know other than like uh, forages and stuff like that, that would be out in the, in the pasture. Mm, I'm not really aware of any um, that I can think of. Okay. So I think that's all of the questions. I'm gonna throw this up just really quickly for you guys so you can see what we've got coming next week. Thank you so much, Dr. Kenichi, for um, visiting with us about this topic.